Welcome to the Nova Confederacia's debate, uh, the end of the liberal international order. Uh, an organizer, uh, Nova Confederacia, is a think zine, the first in Poland and probably uh, in the whole world, think tank and journal in one. Uh, it allows uh, for better communication and synergy between the experts in different fields, as well as between experts and journalists and intellectuals. Uh, all these to increase the level of expertise and most importantly, to create uh, a holistic view on public reality. Mm. The liberal world order uh, apparently is apparently over. Uh, some say that it has ended in 2019, others that the first wave of coronavirus pandemic dealt a final blow uh, to what was described as a US defined and US led global operating system. Uh, we can assume that the stage uh, for the new model of uh, global relations is set. Uh, let me introduce our distinguished guests, uh, cutting edge thinkers, who agreed to join us today and share their thoughts about these crucially important global problems. Uh, Professor John J. Mersheimer, R. Wendell Harrison, Distinguished Service Professor in the Political Science Department at the University of Chicago, an American political scientist and international relations scholar, a scholar, a creator of the theory of offensive realism. Professor Oisten Tuncio, uh, professor of international relations, head of Asia program in Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies, Norwegian Defense University College. MEP Radosław Sikorski, a member of European Parliament and a senior fellow at the Center for European Studies, Studies of Harvard University, a former marshal of the same and Polish Minister of National Defense and Foreign Affairs. Dr. Jacek Bartosiak, president of the geostrategic portal Strategy and Future, Nova Confederacja co-founder and associate, an author of a new book, The End of the End of History, available in Polish only on Nova Confederacja's website. My name is Tomasz Gajewski. I am a lecturer in international uh, in, in Institute of International Relations and Public Policy uh, at the Jan Kochanowski University and an associate of uh, Nova Confederacja. I have a privilege to moderate uh, this debate. Uh, for starters, we warmly welcome you to subscribe uh, Nova Confederacja's YouTube channel, uh, like fan page on Facebook and follow on Twitter for more content. You can find links uh, in the description below. Uh, the debate is financed uh, by uh, the, the National Freedom Institute, Center for Civil Society Development from the Civil Society Organizations Development Program for 2018-2030. In the first part uh, of our debate, I will, uh, I will ask our guests to present their 10 minutes long introductory remarks about the global transformations uh, we are witnessing right now. And let us start with uh, Professor John Mersheimer. Uh, Mr. Professor, uh, this virtual floor is all yours. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, I wish in fact that I were really in Poland uh, instead of having to do this virtually for more reasons than one. Uh, the subject that we're gonna talk about is the liberal international order. And my basic argument is that the liberal international order is effectively dead. Uh, and that there is no chance of resurrecting it. I know that a lot of people believe that with the coming of the Biden administration, uh, there is good reason to think that the liberal international order will be res resurrected. Uh, and I don't think that's gonna happen and I'll tell you why. But <clears throat> let me start by saying that I believe that the liberal international order was created uh, in roughly 1990, uh, when the Cold War ended. A lot of people refer to the liberal international order, this cluster of security institutions and economic institutions that dominated uh, the world over the course of the unipolar moment. Many people seem to think that that liberal international order was in place in 19. Uh, 45 after World War II, and it's continued up to the present. I think this is mistaken. 
Uh, I think that during the Cold War, during the early part of my life, between roughly 1945 and 1989, we lived in a bipolar world where there were two competing orders, a Western order that was dominated by the United States and a communist or Eastern order that was dominated by the Soviet Union. And those two orders were used mainly by the superpowers to wage security competition. But there was no liberal international order. The order was not international. It was, right, it was a bounded order, bounded on the West and bounded on the East. When the Cold War ended, the Soviet dominated order disappeared. It just went away. Uh, and everybody from Poland understands that much better than I do. And what then happened was that the United States took that Western order, that bounded order, and expanded it and tried to turn it into a liberal international order. And a really good example of this is what happened in Eastern Europe, right? The expansion of NATO, the expansion of the European Union, and the various color revolutions were all designed to expand the Western order into an international order, and of course, a liberal international order. Now, my argument is that that order failed because the policies that were embedded in expanding that Western order and transforming it into a liberal international order were fundamentally flawed. I like to argue that the liberal international order contained the seeds of its own destruction. Now, the liberal international order was underpinned by three goals. The first goal was to spread democracy all around the world. The idea was that if you could create a planet that was filled with nothing but democracies, we would all live happily ever after because all Americans believe that democracies are the good guys. And if everybody's a democracy, that means the planet is populated with nothing but good guys. And how can you have anything but peace and prosperity? So the first goal is to spread democracy. The second goal is to integrate states all across the planet and especially the Chinese and the Russians into that open international economy that the United States had created after World War II, and now to expand it globally. And a good example of this would be bringing the Chinese into the WTO, bringing the Russians into important institutions. So the idea is to incorporate every state in the world into that open international economy. That's the second goal. And the third goal, which goes along with that, is to integrate states all over the world into the existing institutions. Because the idea is that once states are integrated into international institutions, they become rule abiding citizens. Institutions, as you all know, are basically all about rules. And if you integrate states into those institutions, they become rule abiding citizens. To put it in Robert Zellick's terminology, they become responsible stakeholders. So again, the liberal international order had three goals underpinning it. One, to spread democracy all around the world. Two, to integrate every country into the liberal international economy or the open international economy. And three, to integrate states into international institutions. When Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, he ran against every one of those goals. He said the United States is getting out of the business of spreading democracy around the world. Number two, he said open an open international economy that emphasizes free trade is just a vehicle for other countries, including our allies, to screw the United States. And third, as you all know, Donald Trump never saw an institution that he didn't hate. NATO was obsolete. He especially hated the WTO. He got rid of the TPP, NAFTA, you name it, as soon as he came into office. Trump hated institutions. He hated the open international economy. He preferred tariffs. And he was not interested in spreading democracy. In fact, as you all know, he liked 
jumping into bed with authoritarian leaders or dictators. He ran against the liberal international order and he was elected president of the United States. Why? Because the liberal international order had failed and the American people said enough is enough. What am I saying? Let's talk about spreading democracy around the world. What's the best example of the United States trying to spread democracy around the world? The Bush Doctrine and what we did in the greater Middle East. This was a colossal failure. The amount of murder and mayhem that the United States is responsible for in the greater Middle East is mind boggling. It was a colossal failure. And Trump explicitly said that. With regard to Eastern Europe, the United States had an opportunity to have good relations with Russia over time. It's certainly in America's interest to have good relations with Russia over time, especially given that we have a potential peer competitor called China, and we're going to need all the help that we can get to deal with that potential peer competitor. It'd be much better to have the Russians on our side of the ledger than on the Chinese side of the ledger. But what happened as a result of NATO expansion, EU expansion, and the color revolutions, the United States ended up poisoning its relations with the Russians and driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. Uh, with regard to China itself, the United States had a policy of engagement with China. Engagement is all about integrating China into the liberal international order. The basic name of the game, the basic name of the game with engagement was to help China become very prosperous and to integrate it into institutions like the WTO to make it a more prominent player in institutions around the world. And the belief was that if we did this successfully, China would eventually become a democracy. And once China became a democracy, we would all live happily ever after. This didn't happen. China has not become a democracy. If anything, it's gone in the other direction. And what we have done is we have created a potential peer competitor. This is a remarkably foolish policy. The United States of America purposely helped China grow more and more powerful with no assurance that it would become a liberal democracy. And even if it became a liberal democracy, nobody could be sure that it would have good relations with the United States. I had many Chinese friends over the years who were amazed that the United States was helping China to grow. This would be like Britain or France or Russia in 1900 helping to make Germany more and more powerful. If you're Britain in 1900, what you want to do is make sure Germany doesn't become more powerful. It's a threat to dominate all of Europe. Asia, China is now a threat to dominate all of Asia. We helped create this monster. This was a result of the liberal international order. It was all designed to make China a democracy, to make it prosperous. And of course, when Trump ran, Trump said China is a potential threat. President Biden, who was part of the foreign policy establishment, was vice president under Barack Obama, he helped feed the beast. President-elect Biden believed back then that integrating China into the liberal international order would end up producing a world in which we all live happily ever after. Well, I got news for you. He was dead wrong. All of this is to say that by 2016, many Americans were fed up with the liberal international order. I could point to other reasons that they were fed up too, and Donald Trump got elected. However, that is not the main reason the liberal international order is dead. In fact, if Biden could, he would try to resurrect but he can't. And the reason he can't, and this is the most important reason, there's not gonna be a new liberal international order. 
is that we now live in a multipolar world. The glacis plates that underpin the system have shifted in fundamental ways. You all remember, you all remember what happened when we went from bipolarity to unipolarity. For poles, the world changed. It was a drastic change going from bipolarity to unipolarity. Well, we're going from unipolarity to multipolarity. In fact, we've already gone from unipolarity to multipolarity. And when that kind of change takes place, it has huge consequences. The end result of this is that you're going to get an American-led order and a Chinese-led order. And that American-led order and that Chinese-led order are going to be mainly designed to wage security competition, just as happened during the Cold War. There was no liberal international order during the Cold War because there were two behemoths in the system that competed fiercely with each other. Well, thanks to the foolish policy of both the Republican and Democratic establishments in the United States, you now have two behemoths in the system, China and the United States, who are going to compete fiercely in the future. And those two behemoths are going to have their own orders, just as the Soviets and the Americans had their own orders, and there's not going to be a liberal international order. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Professor. Uh, and now I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Professor Tuncio. Mr. Professor. Thank you, Thomas. And um, let me thank the uh, Nova Confederation for uh, inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, I think this is a timely topic since the liberal international order is changing. And it's uh, changing for a number of the reasons that uh, Professor Mersheimer has pointed to, because of individuals such as uh, Bush uh, Jr., um, President Trump, um, President Putin and President Xi Jinping have all undermined the liberal international order. Moreover, failure in spreading democracy and unfulfilled liberalization have together with uh, various wars, uh, hyper-globalization, financial crisis, and the role of uh, populism and uh, nationalism destabilized the liberal international order. And fundamentally, um, a shift in the distribution of capabilities among states have not only weakened the liberal international order, but provided the foundations for a new international orders. Um, an order is established and sustained and uh, uh, changed by the most powerful state in the international system. And it can aspire to be international or universal. Alternatively, an order uh, can be regional or issue related. Uh, there is not one international order, but different orders or a mosaic of orders. Uh, all of this is well captured uh, and discussed in Professor Mersheimer's article, Bound to Fail. So what perspective can I bring to this debate? Well, first, I think it is important to establish a hierarchy of causes. And I argue that the most important factor in accounting for the rise and the fall of an order is shifts in the distribution of capabilities among states. And second, since I emphasize the linkage between order and polarity, it is important to get the polarity question right. And here I think Professor Mersheimer and others are mistaken in writing that contemporary international system is multipolar. Instead, I will argue that it is bipolar. So I agree with Mersheimer that, the, that uh, a new liberal international order cannot be resurrected, but that's not because we now have a multipolar system. It's because we have a bipolar system. And what I really cannot understand is that Mersheimer emphasizes the, the role of a US-led order and a Chinese-led order, which to me sounds like a bipolar international system. So how, how can we then uh, conclude that it is a multipolar system. So I would argue that China and the United States are today much more powerful than any other state. The US is still more powerful than China, but China has largely narrowed the power gap between the US and China, and power parity is not necessary for bipolarity. The Soviet Union, for instance, was never as powerful as the Soviet Union during the previous bipolar system. Equally important is the power gap between China and any other state. Some talk about the BRICS countries and multipolarity, 
but the combined GDP of Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa is less than half of China's GDP measured in nominal terms. Moreover, China's GDP and defense spending is today about the same as all the countries, or is, is more or less the same as all the countries in its region combined. So Russia, on the other hand, has a GDP in nominal terms that falls between Spain and Italy. And if Germany spent 2% of its GDP on defense, it would alone have a larger defense spending than Russia. So clearly the US and China are in a league of their own. We have today two superpowers and a bipolar international system. The key question then is, with the return of bipolarity, will we see similar, similar orders as during the previous bipolar system? The short answer is no. The new bipolar system will not be a new Cold War. It will have its own systemic effects and its own characteristics. Uh, so what will the international, regional, and issue-related orders under US-China bipolarity look like? There is likely to be a thin international order shaped by various actors on issues such as climate change, trade, proliferation and arms control, technology standards, and so on. There will also be a US-led and a, U and a China-led orders. Most importantly, the new orders will not be as polarized as during the previous bipolar system. In the economic sphere, the return of bipolarity shapes steps towards decoupling and emphasis on relative gains and zero-sum thinking, but there will still be interdependence instead of independence. There will still be globalization, which is a different economic order from the embargo and blockades we witnessed during the Cold War. Instead of US allies joining a coordinating committee for multilateral export controls or COCOMs, US allies are today negotiating and signing free trade agreements with China. The contemporary interdependence and globalization is unlikely to be erased by the new bipolar system, although it might be reversed as competition and confrontation increases in US-China relations. China is changing technology orders through the development of 5G, through its market position when it comes to personal computers, smartphones, electric vehicles, e-commerce, digital economy, and through its scientific achievements in bioinformatics, robotics, autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, space, and so forth, thereby creating new technology standards and new technology orders that have global effects and distinct from what the Soviet Union accomplished during the Cold War period. Ideologically, a new bipolar system fuels more ideological rivalry between a democratic United States and an authoritarian China. However, the rivalry has different dynamics to the previous bipolar system. China is not seeking revolution or exporting its ideology. Instead, China is aiming to sustain current orders, but at the same time adjust existing orders according to its preferences and interests, and establish alternative orders such as the Belt and Road Initiative and the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Geo in geopolitical terms, um, the new bipolar system creates different security orders and different balancing and stability. The Cold War security order in Europe was static. We got an Iron Curtain and an East-West divide. At the origins of the previous bipolar system, the US was in conventional military terms inferior to the Soviet Union, on the ground in Europe, and US allies were bordering the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact countries. The US could only deter with nuclear weapons. Massive retaliation and mutually assured destruction was the, was the doctrine. This fueled a major arms race and established a terror balance that maintained a security order in Europe for 40 years. Today, the US and China superpower rivalry is not on land, but in the maritime domain of East Asia, where the US has conventional military superiority and there is no need for a similar nuclear deterrence as in Europe during the previous bipolar system. However, this creates a different security order, which is more dynamic. There is no Iron Curtain, no East-West divide, no Berlin War, Wall, but the security order in contemporary East Asia is also more unstable, and there is a higher risk of a limited war between the two superpowers today compared with the Cold War. 
When examining the contemporary US-China security order in East Asia, there's also another crucial difference, the role of sovereignty and nationalism. Many security concerns in East Asia from the East China Sea to Taiwan to the South China Sea and China's border disputes are sovereignty claims and China will not compromise on sovereignty issues. This differs from the Soviet Union, which did not claim sovereignty over East Berlin or East Germany, but had established a buffer zone, which is what China is seeking to establish in East Asia. So the Soviet Union was a status quo power in Europe. China is a revisionist power in East Asia. This creates different stability and different security orders. These new security orders also affect alliances, which are not as rigid as during the Cold War. We're not seeing the establishment of a new NATO or a Warsaw Pact in East Asia. Alliances are more loose today and not as tight as during the Cold War era. Alignment and realignment are more flexible. States are not part of a percentage agreement between the superpowers. The conditions for third ranking states to seek equidistance between the superpowers are greater in the new bipolar system than the previous. In short, new bipolar structural constraints allow states to hedge their bets rather than being forced to choose a side. The new international and regional order that is currently being established by the US and China encompasses a stronger mix of cooperation and competition than the Cold War international and regional order, which was more confrontational. I have focused on US-China rivalry in East Asia because this is the new power center in the world. This means that Europe is geopolitically in the periphery and needs to prepare for a European security order without the strong US role or at best a US that leads from behind. Russia is not a major threat for the US because it can never become a regional hegemon. Here I agree with Mersheimer that the contest for regional hegemony is key. However, the contemporary contest for regional hegemony is only in East Asia between the superpowers, the United States and China. And this strategic competition is the core factor shaping a new international and regional orders. Let me just conclude with a few remarks on Europe. European states need to figure out how to position itself between the US and China led orders. I have argued that in a new bipolar system, it is possible to maintain equidistance to the superpowers. But will this strengthen the European security and economic order? Will equidistance create space for a new Europe-led regional or international order? I am skeptical regarding European strategic autonomy and the prospect of a common foreign and security policy. Instead of reading Mersheimer's recent Bound to Fail article, Maybe we should rather reread his Back to the Future article because the new bipolar system poses many new security challenges for a European economic and security order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, now let's uh, give the floor to the member of European Parliament, Mr. Radosław Sikorski. Thank you. <clears throat> and first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, Nova Confederacia for engaging uh, Professor Mesheimer and um, Professor Tuncio, um, because I think in Poland there is uh, an underappreciation for that realist school of American thinking. There is an assumption that uh, uh, liberal internationalism, whether in the Reagan mode or in the Clinton mode, is dominant, always has been and always will be, which I think is a mistake. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, focus on what Poland should draw from these developments. Um, but let me first uh, comment um, uh, on what Professor Mersheimer has said, because I agree with his conclusions, but not with his <laughs> road of uh, the, the way he got to them. <laughs> Namely, I agree that we will have a duopoly, a, a, a Chinese-American order. Um, I also agree that the liberal order was uh, a feature of the 90s and the 2000s. For me, the first Gulf War is a, be is a better, um, you know, re reconquering of Kuwait from Saddam Hussein was a better example of, um, of the world coming together around the principle. 
Uh, but yes, we in Eastern Europe were also an icon of American success in, in, in the Cold War. Um, where I disagree with him is he, he says that the expansion of NATO and the EU drove Russia into China's arms. Um, first of all, it wasn't really an expansion. It was us uh, knocking on the door for many years and then finally being admitted. Um, and I, I disagree that that's what drove Russia, because um, actually when we joined NATO and the EU um, in 99 and then 2004, relations with Russia improved. We had our own um, reset with Russia. I could go into details, but it was quite successful. Let me just say that President Putin was the first leader of Russia who went to Katyn and honored the murdered Polish officers. But there were many other practical things. And I put to you that what um, did it was ideology, uh, was the 2011 uh, mass rallies in Moscow, which scared President Putin into uh, thinking that his power was um, threatened. And he put his personal interest of holding on to power before the geostrategic interests of Russia, uh, which I think uh, uh, would favor a, a, a closer alignment with the West. Um, uh, but he now feels solidarity with other autocrats. I have to uh, defend President Trump because you claim that he came to the conclusion that uh, you have to have better relations with Russia. Uh, and yes, that's what he said, but look at what happened. It was he who imposed sanctions on Nord Stream 2. It was he who imposed the toughest sanctions on Russia in history in response to uh, the murder of Major Skripal in Britain and, uh, and other events. And it was he who did what Obama refused to do, which is to send lethal arms to Ukraine. So I put to you that there may have been some deeper American interests involved if even Trump, Trump uh, did that. Um, I think China would have risen as a peer competitor anyway, whatever we've done, but, but we probably accelerated it and we lost the bet. I agree, we, we, we bet that if, if we uh, grant them the uh, uh, market economy status, they would uh, liberalize the economy first and possibly politics uh, later. And we lost that bet, just like we lost the bet on Russia, we lost the bet on the Middle East, and we have terrible results. I would, on the other hand, defend Obama and Biden. I think they had the same reading of China. It's just that they wanted to use different methods. Instead of haranguing the Chinese publicly, they wanted to create the Trans-Pacific uh, free trade area to uh, create um, um, incentives for allies to, 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 to draw away from China. Now, if uh, Professor Merzheimer is right that we, have, we are going to have this bipolar American-Chinese uh, world, then what is a, 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 a state like Poland, a frontline state of NATO, to do? Well, if the Americans mishandle the uh, struggle for primacy with the Chinese and they get uh, themselves involved in a uh, war that is not just a trade war, but a kinetic one, then the consequences for us are very severe indeed, because uh, all American resources will be devoted to that. And American legions will be pulled away from Europe uh, and um, sent to, uh, to the Far East. And then Poland will be exposed yet again. Because you see, I think NATO was revived by President Putin when he invaded Ukraine. You, NATO was becoming a political talking shop uh, until uh, Putin put his uh, green men in, into Crimea. Um, and of course, Poland, not being a nuclear state, uh, having the capabilities that it does, cannot provide for its own security if Russia became hostile. Um, so what I'd like to hear from Professor Masheimer is what he thinks of the policy of the current Polish government, which has um, uh, put Poland 
sort of in the category of South Korea, namely paying for American uh, security guarantees. You know, I signed the agreement with Condi for the uh, missile defense site in Poland. And under the agreement I signed, Americans built the base. We kept the jurisdiction of American personnel. We've now signed a deal with the US whereby um, uh, we've given up our jurisdiction and we will pay $500 million per annum for American facilities uh, in Poland. And we've, we are now buying equipment exclusively from the United States. Uh, I'd like to know from Professor Merzhamek, can the US be rented as a security provider, and can you rely on such a relationship? And, um, and the other question in my mind is uh, what the role of the EU uh, can be in such an alignment. And I put to you that the interest of Poland and the EU is to cooperate as closely as, as, possi as possible with the US on changing China's behavior in, sp in uh, outer space, in cyberspace, in, um, in the trade of physical goods, in the setting of standards, um, in infrastructure, short of uh, going to war on, uh, on, on the American side. Because our public wouldn't support it, we have nothing to bring uh, uh, to it, and our economy couldn't stand it. So where I think the EU could be useful in that new post-liberal order world is as a, as a center of regulation and an ally of the United States in um, creating a reg regulatory regimes that the allies of the West on China's periphery, India, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, uh, Philippines, um, uh, can relate to without being sucked into the uh, Chinese space. Um, but I'm uh, but I'm most interested interested in in this. What should Poland do, and how likely it is that the U.S. will avoid a hot confrontation with China? Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let's, um, the comments uh, will be after the, the end of this part. Uh, my plan for this debate uh, is now struggling to survive. And uh, now, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Jacek Bartoszak has the floor. And then uh, we comment on uh, those questions. Okay. Thank you again for having me on this panel. Uh, uh, as uh, Radek Sikorski was uh, drawing our attention to, to the sort of uh, uh, Polish perspectives on the changing global order. Let me maybe say a few words from the perspective of, as I would call, the new Polish realism, so to speak. Um, so I see the world uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union based on the preponderance of the United States. And preponderance is a good word because that uh, shows that the United States had uh, such a military edge, economic edge, edge, edge in all the institutions, that it controls the affairs of the world. And supported by the, the whole league of the Western nations, uh, underpinned by the US global maneuver force, the US presence in Eurasia, actually it created not only a solo, US solo, but all, a concert of Western powers that were influencing the agenda of the world affairs. And that was it. The underpinning concept that was the foundation of power uh, was twofold. First was the, uh, the US global maneuvering force and uh, capability to project power to Eurasia freely and without obstruction from the Soviet Union that had collapsed. The second thing, and it predated the existence of the United States, was based on the strategic flows with the main uh, with the main volume of strategic flows being concentrated on the maritime trade and everything even remotely connected to the maritime domain. Uh, this uh, United States inherited from Great Britain and uh, then from Western European sailors that dominate the world ocean. Uh, and this is why uh, my proposition is that what we are facing now is not only the demise of the US uh, in the polar moment since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Not only the greatest change since the Second World War, 
but are maybe the greatest change of and the structural shift of power since the great discovery and the great uh, uh, ocean, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean Revolution, the World Ocean Revolution 500 years ago. And it was all based on the strategic flows, movement of people, goods, technology, knowledge, wisdom, uh, information, uh, invention, and projecting military power. And that put the West on top of the system. Uh, and uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it seemed to us that we arrived at the final destination of the humanity, underpinned by this uh, benevolent US power, which was far away from Eurasia, but still underpinned its security. Of course, it was, uh, it ended. It ended for two reasons. The first reason was that the Chinese always outperform and outproduce everybody if they have access to the freedom of strategic flows. And this freedom was the foundation of the free world in the Cold War system. You, you know, in the West, you, you were, you know, people were moving, technology was moving, information was moving, cargo was moving, everything was moving. If you accepted the Ten Commandments of the United States uh, hegemony, then you could work within the system. And the Chinese entered the system and outproduced, outperformed, out outwitted, and were simply smarter. And in the process, destroyed the foundation of the US power in the global affairs. And the second factor, including China, but also Russia, was that following the uh, Admiral Gorshkov, continental strategy, the, the mar maritime strategy of the continental power, uh, both China and, US and uh, Russia um, developed the anti axer denial capabilities, along with the revolution military affairs, that sort of obstructed and still obstruct the US freedom of maneuver in Eurasia and around Eurasia. And that impacts the freedom of strategic flows and who is in charge of the way the strategic flows are being regulated. And that is just the beginning. So the, the liberal world order is gone. The rise of China is, uh, is the phenomenon that has already shaken the world. It is inevitable. Uh, and actually, it was the US that finally abandoned the liberal world order. And under Trump, they did it because they realized that if you have the preponderance, then you need to pay transaction costs. And you know, within the family of nations, they don't care about you too much as opposed if you were just started a balancing game, then you are much bigger and more powerful. And Trump did it. He decided to switch to the balancing game uh, situation where suddenly the body of the United States and its geopolitical weight matter. So you could you know, work bilateral, or you could do whatever actually you wanted and you could force the other party decisively. That was a bet that the United States made. But it failed. It failed because, first of all, it upset allies. And second is that it turned us out again that China is quite an opponent. You simply cannot defeat China in the process. And it turned out also that the center of gravity of the competition are the strategic flows and exactly the, the global supply chains that are a backbone of strategic flows. And who is in charge? and innovation, technology, military power projection, and China has made a lot of uh, success in all those places. Patiently, they also created a structure that was more productive. United States stopped producing. Uh, United States never feared Soviet Union uh, in terms of productivity and uh, money-making. They feared Soviet Union because of its military potential. But the fear that was instilled in the United States decision makers recently was not only because of that, but mostly because China outperformed in industry and now it is on the path to outperform out out also in innovation. And that is a game changer. That is a game changer. So it's a fear that you can see in the behavior of the United States. 
And that, all that brings, of course, structural tensions all across the world, and especially in crash zones, geopolitical crash zones, when the sphere, spheres of influence are not static. Central and Eastern Europe is one place, Western Pacific, South China Sea, of course, and uh, the East China Sea is the second place. Uh, deglobalization is in the process, but it's still to be seen whether it's finally possible. And the reason why it might not be possible is that this time around, it's going to be quite a challenge for the US. With Soviet Union, it was an easy thing. It, a, a easy thing. Both powers did all they could to avoid war. And the borders were clear. Where Soviet troops were in 1945, they remained. Now it's a different game. Now the United States would need to exercise a full-scale rollback to really diminish the, the rise of China. And that is highly escalatory in technology, in markets. But the tragic situation is that the same applies to US. Because if US doesn't stop that and doesn't exercise the active rollback, the United States social contract will break down sooner or later as well. So this is a great challenge for the new administration. There are two options for the US. And of course, it will not be a liberal world order anymore, but it will be a balancing game, a major balancing game. Either Biden will exercise the full rollback with everything that it entails and the risk of a kinetic war. I mean, a very risky proposition or a fallback and consolidation. Just let those Chinese produce what they do. Let them have those strategic flows, but we believe in our strength rebuild our economy, create new connectivities, new innovations, new R&Ds. Let's have this second enhanced Sputnik moment and let's get back in the game in 15 years. And probably this is what the world would like to hear from the US administration because as Professor Tunisio properly stated, people are opportunistic. They don't want to choose sides. They want to live. And the problem is that uh, what the uh, United States has been trying to do was against the Crow Memorandum post postulation that uh, the, 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 the hegemon cannot constrain freedom of strategic flows because there will be a coalition against it. And this is what Trump initiated. My last point about Europe. Europe being weak, not consolidated, still will be a pivot in this game. And more, most interestingly, it will be Germany that may decide the fate of this competition with its market, with its uh, innovation, with its central role connecting East and West of the continent. And Poland will watch closely what the uh, Germans will be doing. Maybe if I have more time during the next you know, turn, I will speak more about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bartoszak. Uh, this voice concludes the first part of our debate. Uh, thank you for all your uh, remarks, and now uh, it's time for short comments or rejoinders, and then we will move to the next uh, part. Uh, Mr. Professor uh, Mersheimer, uh, would you like to comment? Yes, I'll say a few words on what each of my colleagues said, and I cannot come close to covering all the points that they made. Uh, I agree with much of what was said. Uh, so I'll focus on points where there's some disagreement. Uh, just to go to Professor Tanjo's uh, comments, he and I are in agreement on all sorts of things, of course. Uh, I think whether you call it a bipolar world or a multipolar world ultimately does not matter that much because I agree that Russia is by far the weakest of those three great powers and the two real gorillas in the system are China and the United States, which was reflected in my comments where I hardly mentioned Russia. So I think it's largely a definitional issue between us. We could get into it, but it's not worth going into it. Uh, I thought your most interesting point was that Russia should make, excuse me, that Europe should maintain an equal distance between uh, China and uh, the United States. In other words, as this Sino-American competition unfolds, Europe should try to sit on the fence, not commit to either side. Uh, 
when I deal with Professor Sikorsky's or Mr. Sikorsky's comments, I'll say more about this, but I think that would be a fundamental mistake. I think Europe has a deep-seated interest uh, in being on America's side. Uh, and uh, I'll say more about that in a minute, but if you wanna keep the American military in Europe, and if I were a European, especially if I was Polish, I would want the Americans to stay in Europe. I would want NATO to remain intact. And if you try to sort of sit on the fence, uh, you're gonna enrage the Americans. And the United States is a ruthless great power and you don't wanna enrage the United States. But I'll say more about that. But, but, but I think the Russians, on the other hand, have a vested interest in sitting on the fence and not committing too heavily to either side, right? So I think for the Russians, the strategy that you propose for the Europeans makes sense, but I don't think it makes good sense for the Europeans. And let me expand on that by uh, dealing with uh, Mr. Sikorsky's points. Uh, he and I obviously disagree on NATO expansion and EU expansion and I, I'll just put that aside because I don't think that is that important an issue uh, when we talk about sort of where the world is today and where it's headed. Uh, King asked the question, what should Polish policy be? Uh, and he talked about Poland being like South Korea. And the question is, can you rent the United States? I would say just for starters, Poland, in South Korea are in very different situations today because South Korea is an absolutely essential ally for the United States for purposes of containing China. So South Korea's strategic importance is unquestioned. Poland is in a dicier situation, a more difficult situation. Uh, I don't think it makes sense for Poland or any other country to think about the Americans in terms of renting them. I think that's gonna get any country, including Poland, uh, into a lot of trouble. And my view on Poland uh, is that Poland wants to keep the Americans in Europe. And the two key factors that will determine whether the Americans stay are number one, how severe the Chinese threat becomes. Your rhetoric, we talked about, you know, China and the United States really getting into it and the Americans withdrawing the legions from Europe. That could conceivably happen if China becomes such a formidable threat that we have no choice but to really put all of our assets in Asia. So as I've said on numerous occasions to European audiences, Europeans have a vested interest in hoping that Chinese economic growth slows down over time because that will work to keep us in Europe. So that would be point number one. But my second point, getting back to Professor Tanjo's argument, is that Europeans, have to be on America's side, and this is mainly economically, against China. They can't be equidistant because if you're equidistant, you're not with the Americans. You're gonna remove an important rationale for the United States staying in Europe. So my view is that what Poles and Europeans more generally should do is tell the Americans, Here's the deal. You stay in Europe, you keep NATO intact, right? We'll pay our fair share, but more importantly, we will not feed the beast, i.e. China. We will not trade in dual use technology and do assorted other things that are likely to anger you. Our attitude on 5G, will, for example, will be basically pro-American, not pro-Chinese. There'll be some outliers like the Portuguese and the Germans will do a little 5G, 
but we're basically with you. And I think if that happens, the Americans will stay in Europe. And I want to be very clear here. I, I, from my point of view, it's not in America's interest to stay in Europe, right? From my point of view as an American, if I'm wearing a Polish hat or a European hat, it is in your interest for us to stay in Europe. And you should go to great lengths to keep us there. And again, the two key factors are how serious the Chinese threat is, how much growth there is, and number two, whether you can basically work with the Americans uh, on the economic front. Uh, very quickly, uh, with regard to Mr. Bartosiak's uh, points, I just wanted to say that you made a point about China being excellent at playing the capitalist game that I think is exactly right. In the United States, a lot of people on the right are trying to portray China as a communist threat, sort of like the Soviet Union, because it's nominally a communist country. Our great problem is that China is not a communist country. We should wish that China was a communist country because it would end up like the Soviet Union. The fact is they are as good at playing the capitalist game as the Americans and the Europeans are. And that's what makes me so scared about them. Uh, I was in China for a month in October of last year, October 2019. I hadn't been there for a few years. It's really scary how impressive Chinese technological uh, and economic sophistication is. And, uh, uh, and, and this is because they are capitalists par excellence. Uh, they're not uh, communists at all. Uh, final point I would make to you is I've given my standard talk on whether China can rise peacefully probably about 130 times, and I've probably given it 30 times in China. And I've always been surprised at the number of people who have come up to me afterwards, both in the United States and in China. And these are reasonable people, not you know, wild-eyed ideologues or anything like that, who believe that there are structural problems inherent in Chinese society or in the Chinese economy that are going to slow down economic growth over time. A number of people have told me, a good number of people have told me over time, John, the problem that you're worried about, whether China's rise would be peaceful, uh, is not going to be an issue on the table down the road because Chinese economic growth is going to slow down. And they, of course, point to demographic problems, problems with the banking system and so forth and so on. Uh, I don't know whether that is likely to happen, but I do think it is possible that that will happen. Uh, the Chinese economic growth will slow down. And as I said in response uh, to Mr. Sikorsky's discussion, I think on, on what Poland should do down the road, I think it's in Poland's interest to hope that uh, Chinese economic growth slows down. And it's certainly in our interest, America's interest, to see uh, China uh, stop growing in, in a meaningful way. In fact, I'd like to see the Chinese economy flatline. And it's not because I don't like the Chinese people. Uh, I actually love going to China. Uh, but I think from an American strategic point of view, the last thing we want is a peer competitor, especially a peer competitor that has many more people than us and plays the capitalism game as well as we do. Anyway, Tomas, those are my quick comments in response to those three excellent presentations. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cross. Uh, gentlemen, would you like to comment? Yeah. Um, I can Mr. Tuncio, please. I, th I think uh, I have three, four points, so I'll try and make them quick. Uh, first, though, I think I think it do matters whether we call it a multipolar or a bipolar system. If it actually was a multipolar system, the United States could pull back and other great powers could have balanced China. But that's not the case. The only power that can balance China is the United States. So that creates very different uh, systemic effects. Uh, and I think it's very important that we that we uh, speak about this as a new bipolar system and not a multipolar system because that's a misguided uh, perspective. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to go into the, the definitions to draw up more statistics for why I think China is 
it's much more powerful than India or Germany or Russia or Japan or any other. Uh, but I think it's it's crucial to to have that as a starting point. Um, second, I think uh, maybe Professor Mersheimer just misunderstood me a little bit because I I tried to say that the difference between this new bipolar system compared with the previous one is it's more possible to keep an equidistance between the superpowers. It's not as this east-west divide. It's not this kind of that states are forced to choose sides as they were in sort of uh, the uh, the early Cold War years. Um, I, of course, would argue that Norway as a NATO ally should have very close security uh, collaboration with the United States. I uh, am a strong opinion against, for instance, that Norway is currently um, uh, negotiating on a free trade agreement with China. And I, I, I think that is a, is a mistake to move in that direction. Uh, I, I think it's a mistake because of Norwegian national interest is not served by being more dependent economically on China. But secondly, because it sends the, the wrong signals to our most important security guarantee, uh, the United States. So, so I was talking about this bipolar system creating different structural constraints, not uh, my kind of preferences, what kind of policy uh, European countries should choose. Of course, many of those uh, NATO allies should choose to be a close ally of the United States. And I think they have strong interest to continue being that um, and thereby choosing sides, actually, although this bipolar system allows them not to choose sides uh, in a similar way as the previous bipolar system. And then thirdly, um, when it comes to Bartoszka's uh, point about what's in it for Poland, I think Norway is bordering uh, Russia too. Um, and we are thinking strategically about many of the same issues. And, and to military planners in Norway, they have a plan for a, for a conflict that erupts somewhere else, not on our border, not a strategic attack by the Russians, but maybe a conflict in the Bal uh, Baltic states or in, in the Black Sea or something like that. And this creates this kind of bastion defense in the North, Russia, uh, is, is kind of invading Norway, not because they want to invade Norway, but because they want to uh, protect their northern fleet and so forth. Um, but if this all starts in the Taiwan Strait, uh, Norwegian military planners have not a uh, plan B. Uh, they don't have you know, all the kind of plans for how the US and the US Marine Corps or whoever it might be are, are going to come to Norway and, and, and help out. This is, this is not going to work out if, if the United States finds itself in a conflict with China over Taiwan or in the South China Sea. So we have to start thinking about this in Europe. And for Norway, which has a geopolitical different position than Poland, for Poland, I think the solution is to, to see, seek closer cooperation with Germany, if that's possible. But for Norway, we need to look to, to, to the maritime domain. We need to look to Britain, of course, we need to look to uh, France, uh, the Netherlands, and, and also the Nordic countries uh, as a kind of uh, hedging our bets uh, for, for that kind of eventualities. So I think that is, uh, that is uh, something that many uh, countries uh, that are bordering Russia should, should really think strategically about uh, this kind of new rivalry between the United States and China, because it's changing the kind of military situation in, in, in Europe. Um, so I'll just throw that in, and I'll uh, I'll stop there and allow others to 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 uh, make comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, and now uh, maybe Mr. Shikorsky, uh, would you like to join and comment? Yes, with pleasure. Um, uh, first of all, um, thank you, Professor Tuncio, for um, suggesting that we should cooperate closely in security. Uh, with Germany. Um, in fact, that's what we are doing. Not everybody knows that Poland has the same number of German tanks as Germany. And if, <laughs> um, and the collaboration continues despite the political rhetoric of, of, of the current government. Um, um, I think equal distance from the US and China is not sustainable either in Europe, but I'll come to that. What I'm alarmed by is that 
I agree with so much of what Professor Mesheimer is saying, because in some circles in Poland, he's the devil incarnate, as we know, uh, for being a critic of um, NATO enlargement. Um, but yes, he's right that Europe should um, uh, uh, should uh, um, fight for, for American goodwill. And we have done so. Uh, for example, we've maintained an arms embargo on the People's Republic ever since Tiananmen. Um, and uh, I think it's been somewhat effective. But here's the problem. Um, as Europe, and it's not just Germany, although Germany is the industrial heartland of the European Union, and Poland at some level is, a, is a, an economy that supplies uh, parts, for example, for the German auto industry. As Europe, we cannot maintain our standard of living without our trade with China. We something like a quarter of our exports go to China. So whether we can maintain this relationship with the United States is, depends on how the US structures this. And, and let me put it bluntly the way I do without beating about the bush. If you try to bring us to heel the way you did uh, over Iran. Um, that was an easy choice. Um, European companies were forced to choose between trading with Iran or trading with the United States. Easy. But if you try to do the same uh, as regards China, uh, we will be put under unbearable pressure because we can't live without our trade with China. So it has to be much more subtle than that. You need our cooperation. We cannot afford a diktat from the United States on, on trade with China. But we can do great things together. Professor Tunzio mentioned COCOM. And in my various um, reports uh, uh, in the European Parliament, I have actually insinuated into official documents the idea of reviving COCOM and but widening its remit. It shouldn't be just technology transfers because soon we'll actually be importing technology from China. It should be outgoing investments, incoming investments, and it should be production and research standards, use and misuse of data, use and misuse of humans for experiments and whole societies for experiments and so on. Because here, China also has an undue advantage stemming from its, from its uh, undemocratic system. And here, if we stick together with the United States and America's allies on China's rim, then I think we can bring them to heel. Um, and let me finish by also echoing Professor Tunzio, um, namely that whether the rivalry stays peaceful or becomes kinetic is no longer under, uh, uh, under US control. Because it is China that has declared that Taiwan will be reunified. I can't remember by which date but some anniversary of uh, of of the people of of the uh, communist party of china and if that happens the us will have a really difficult choice to make whether to maintain the credibility of its alliances in east asia or not and and let me just add one more footnote um that i am not cheered by the fact that there are structural problems in, in China and that that will ch uh, uh, slow China's growth. Because the slowing down might not be linear, but might be um, sudden. I mean, most surges in infrastructure investments 
like China's, have historically ended up in a debt failure and a financial crash and a, and a, and a big um, discontinuity. But that's precisely the kinds of conditions in which the leadership of a non-democratic country might want to externalize those tensions. You know, it's said of the Third Reich that it was always three months away from bankruptcy, right? But it didn't stop them from launching a world war, quite the contrary. So that plus Taiwan uh, are my sources of worry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chikorsky. Uh, and uh, now I would like to please uh, for a very, very brief and short comment from Dr. Bartoszczak. Uh, a, a few short uh, comments. First of all, this military situation in the Western Pacific is not optimistic for the US either. Because if there is a war, there is a great chance that the U.S. will lose, and the American allies are watching. So uh, we can't take it for granted that, uh, given the, the you know the uh, close proximity to the shores and the exercise, nice, the Chinese might simply win this war, especially if it's a sh short war. And then what? This is one thing, and it, it is already happening because people watch. So strategic signaling is the key. Uh, and also the situation is very escalatory because US seems that thinks that they have the conventional uh, advantage over China. So the Chinese may be afraid that there might be a decapitation attack. And because the United States also enjoys the nuclear advantage, so the Chinese might think that they will ha not have a chance of second strike. So it's much more escalatory situation in terms of security than the, between Soviet Union and US. And given the rollback and so many you know, flashpoints that are not resolved under Yalta or Potsdam agreements, as it was with the Soviet Union, it's highly escalatory, highly escalatory. Now, speaking of Europe, uh, I, it, was, uh, it was nice to hear from uh, Radek Sikorski um, about um, this sort of European perspective about China, because in either way, European social contract will be broken and Europe needs to give me the strategic argument, how it wants to survive as a consolidated uh, sort of organism. Because if we go along with the United States, our social contract will be broken anyway because of the disruption with uh, China. And if we decide to create one Eurasia, it will be broken uh, from the other you know, side. And that brings me to the most fundamental question of our times and for Poland, the German question. German question and Germans being again, again in the center of, of European politics. Because with, uh, with the demise of the liberal world order, the balancing game has returned also internally to Europe. And we have a major fight between France and Germany, how to simply now structure the European equilibrium. The France simply thinks that the United States has already lost primacy. So Europe should be part of Eurasia, with, of, co of course, France, you know, being in charge of it, while Germans still want to sit on the fence, but if they are pushed to the side, they want to be with the United States. For Poland, and this is my address to Radek Sikorski, for Poland, it's a essentially most important question, and we should help the Germans to make this step. Poland should signal to Germany that we understand that structure is changing and we accept the new hierarchy in Europe with the German leading role in the system as a sort of a, uh, as a, sort of a balancer, but with the U US outer hegemony accepted because that was exactly the, the message from the, from the German uh, uh, defense minister Said that mentioned that a few times in the last couple of weeks. This is critically important because it changes the structure of the European order to Poland's benefit. It is providing us with a secure, proper security and potential, and it's eliminating the completely dual ideas of France to invite Russia to the new balancing game on the old continent, which will all, which was always and will be forever against the US, the Poland's the national interest. Uh, so this is the solution. And I, I also think that it's very good for the United States, the new administration, to accept the new German proposal that Germans call the new German realism. I really wonder 
what uh, the Polish leadership is thinking about it, including the opposition. And uh, because this is a different proposition that was so far addressed to po Polish political life. So far, it was European Union, French-like federation. Now it's a German proposition with the acceptance of the superior American role acting from distance with the nuclear umbrella and the acceptance that Germans will create the order in Central and Eastern Europe. And that is a, 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 a structural shift from the previous situation. We will see if it holds with, in, in German uh, political life because of those tensions, as Radek Sikorsky mentioned, trade with China and other things. But this is a, green, a light in the tunnel because otherwise Europe is not facing a bright prospect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have so many questions and uh, not so much time. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask you a couple of questions, but we must be very, very dynamic because we are running out of time. So I kindly ask you for very, very short answers. Uh, first of all, um, uh, will the United States uh, try to revive the West and uh, reconstruct uh, the uh, as Professor Mersheimer argues, Euro-Atlantic bounded liberal order. Uh, and maybe the EU uh, have a chance to be a second lung, a second healthy lung of the West in that uh, kind of situation. Uh, Mr. Professor Mersheimer, would you like to comment? I like to say that historically, the United States has cared greatly about three areas outside of the Western hemisphere. Western Europe or Europe, uh, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf. Those are the three areas that we've been willing uh, to fight and die for, spend huge amounts of uh, blood. Uh, historically, Europe has been by far the most important area of the world to the United States. Despite the fact the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor and that's what brought us into World War II, uh, it was, uh, a Europe first policy throughout World War II. Uh, what's happened today is that for the first time in our history, Asia, East Asia, has become the most important area of the world. Asia is more important strategically to the United States than Europe is. Furthermore, the Persian Gulf is now the second most important area of the world to us, and Europe is number three. And the reason that the Gulf is so important is that China now gets 25% of its oil from the Gulf and will get more of its oil from the Gulf. And the Chinese will tell you behind closed doors, they're building a blue water Navy in large part to protect their sea lines of communication from the East Asian coast to the Persian Gulf. So we are gonna be deeply involved militarily in the Persian Gulf against the Chinese over time. Europe is going to be number three on those, on the list of priorities outside of the Western hemisphere. And it's gonna be a distant third. And the reason is there is no potential hegemon in Europe. You talk about Germany. Germany is depopulating at a rapid pace. According to most demographic projections, Germany, which has the most people of any European country today, will have as many people in 2050 as France and Britain will be, have in 2050. Germany is not going to be any special great power in Europe. So the United States has no compelling reason to stay in Europe. It has a compelling Europe to be deeply involved in Asia because of China, and also in the Persian Gulf because of China, but not in Europe militarily. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, maybe Mr. Professor Tunzio uh, with a brief answer. Yes, no, I, I think uh, I, I would agree with the kind of uh, priority that uh, Professor Merstheimer is, is laying out here. I think for the first time, and I think uh, Bartosak pointed to this as well, first time in about 500 years that this kind of power shift and the, the power center in the world is shifting to another region than Europe. Um, and this is significant. Uh, and I think going back to your question about a Euro-Atlantic order, I think this what's come up or I find is very interesting. Uh, 
uh, this debate uh, in, in Poland about the relationship to Germany uh, and this kind of division of labor, I will call it, in transatlantic relations where, where the United States has this kind of light footprint in Europe but keeps its role as a nuclear uh, umbrella uh, and allows for a more uh, prominent strategic role for Germany if Germany itself is willing to, uh, to take up that burden. And in that kind of discussion, uh, the contest between France and Germany, uh, I think Nordic countries as well, uh, in collaboration with, with, with Poland, would, would probably agree to, uh, to this kind of discussions uh, uh, of, uh, with the Germans, go to the Germans, talk to the Germans, ask for the Germans to, to play a more prominent role in, in sustaining a a new economic and security order in, in Europe. So, so this might be difficult with France, it might be difficult with some Southern European countries, but I think in, in the Nordic countries, you might find some allies uh, uh, with, with Poland in, in, this, in this task, if that is something Poland actually is considering doing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, Mr. Sikorski, do you want to weigh in? No. Look, I have a request to Novak Konfederacja. Could you please tell the current Polish ruling party and, and the president um, uh, what has emerged in this discussion? Because I agree with it, that Europe will be distant third on the list of American priorities. Europe as a whole, let alone Poland, because our ruling party seems to think that the US thinks of nothing more most of the time than how to protect Poland. And that is just not true. Less important than South Korea, okay? And however many contracts we award to Raytheon, uh, the US will make its judgments on strategic grounds and that you can't rent the US for, for, for Poland's protection, okay? Um, secondly, um, on the role of Germany, um, I, I'd just like to remind you that I was the person who said in Berlin in 2011, I fear German power less than I fear German inactivity, okay? <laughs> and on return to Warsaw, I was called a traitor, and there was a motion for my dismissal in the Polish parliament, okay, by the current ruling party. Um, uh, German role is one option, and then we have a kind of continuation of the transatlantic status quo. The other option, and I, I read France's intention differently from um, Dr. Bartosha. Uh, the, uh, as I understand Macron's offer to Germany is to pool the, the great power resources of France, uh, nuclear weapons, permanent seats in the Security Council, uh, a, a, a world-class diplomatic service with German economic might to create a, a Europe that would be strategically autonomous. It's more ambitious, it's perhaps less realistic, but I think either of those options would actually be quite attractive for Poland. And Poland would could play the pro-American, the pro-Atlantic part in that uh, in that deal that uh, secures some important uh, West uh, European interests while collaborating with the US, which is, like, which is, I think, the sensible option. Okay, it's, it's, yeah, it's perfect that uh, Radek Sikorsky raised this issue with France at, at last because this is a critically important uh, difference. The continental choice that uh, we were talking about for, for last year, right now is divided into two choices, pro-German and pro-French. French proposition is disastrous for Poland, and not because we are such a zealots of independence and so on, but for two reasons. First of all, France is not a great power, and it actually doesn't have nuclear weapons in terms of understanding that it can influence the escalation ladder in Central and Eastern Europe facing Russia. So they don't count here. I mean, those guys don't matter here in Central and Eastern Europe, as opposed to the United States, which is a global maneuver force. So the, the Macron's statement that he, ha, he has nuclear weapons completely are irrelevant in Central and Eastern Europe, if we, we can talk in detail about the military strategies and so on. But simply those guys didn't create the nuclear weapons for that purpose. 
So it's not existent. This is this is one thing. The second thing is that the, in French plan, they want to invite Russia to keep the balance, to play the balancing game in Eurasia. So they, they always do it for the last 250 years, destroying Poland and Central and Eastern Europe. Because if Russia is inviting to play the balancing game in Europe, then it's all over. And this is what Macron is trying to do for the last uh, one year. And if, Germ if we follow the German uh, path, so Germans will always have the, the high boss of the United States, light-footed in Europe, only nuclear umbrella, space assets, sensors, global maneuver force, maybe the, the trade, freedom of trade with the United States, but still, but still it will be the US will be a final arbitrator and Germany automatically will be posed and poised against Russia in a way, not antagonistically, but it will not, it will be negotiating the political space with Russia to the Poland's benefit. It's a completely different solution to our eternal problem. And by the way, Norwegian problem too. So uh, this is the perspective uh, which is quite fundamentally different. And this is why probably there is such a, a, a turmoil between the German and the French um, strategies these days when we talk to them. So uh, this is what I wanted to say at, at, uh, at the end. So it's a German question that will be decided. And it will be also critically important for the United States because United States is not 10 feet tall. It is struggling to, to survive as a primary uh, global power now. And uh, it will need allies. Tomas, can I ask my three colleagues a question that... Uh, of course, Mr. Professor, but very, very briefly, if I may ask. I'm curious how you think Poland and Germany and Norway provide for their nuclear deterrence in the absence of the United States. In, in other words, the Russians have nu a huge nuclear arsenal. That's obviously the only reasonable threat to Europe. The Americans have nuclear weapons. They provide a nuclear umbrella. But what happens when that nuclear umbrella goes away? But it, but it will, if I may, if it will not go away because the German proposition to the U.S. new administration is that you guys keep your nuclear umbrella. We accept your, we pay allegiance to you. We accept your sort of overriding arbitrary rule here in Europe, and we will be your go-to guy to create order in Europe. So. In this way, Germans are reconciling their continental and Westbindung position. It's very smart on the part of the Germans because they remember the sins of the past and they don't want to make the bad choice again as Macron is pushing them to do. And the, the, the Americans could accept it because they will, feel, they will never feel threatened by Germany and consolidated Europe anymore if they keep providing nuclear umbrella. And Poland is happy. So, I mean, it's, of course, we can go into the details, but this is sort of a solution that Russians will hate. I would note to you that during the Cold War, when the United States had hundreds of thousands of troops in Europe and thousands of nuclear weapons in Europe, there was a huge problem with the credibility oh, of, of this, your umbrella. And if of you course. have a situation where the Americans physically leave Europe, it's hard to believe that that nuclear umbrella is going to have much meaning. I think it will, because still it's a nuclear umbrella, plus the Europeans will feel the conventional force. And Russia is not a superpower anymore, and it doesn't have a massive army anymore. So it can be contained uh, by Central and Eastern Europeans, including Germans, quite easily. Uh, President Tuncio, Mr. Sikorsky, two short comments. No, I, I still think yeah, that uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella can be sustained for, for many years. Uh, so I, I don't think it's, uh, you know, uh, the current, there are other issues we need to solve uh, in the current sort of security, military and strategic debates in, in Europe. Uh, but of course, I mean, if, if this eventuality would appear sometimes in the decades ahead, then of course one has to think about it, but 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 I think I don't think this is anything a question that will change the kind of uh, equilibrium in, in Europe anytime soon. Um, I find it uh, incomprehensible to think of Russia invading Norway with nuclear weapons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor, uh, Mr. Sikorsky, The last remark from you. 
Well, I I think it would happen differently. I enjoyed Maybe. the series, the series occupied <laughs> about the occupation of <laughs> of Norway, which I thought was very realistic. Um, but um, uh, well, uh, after that Helsinki uh, press conference by President Trump with Vladimir Putin, at which he said that he trusted his friend Vladimir more than he trusted the FBI. I have to tell you that my faith in the American nuclear umbrella and the fact that President Trump would go on the escalation ladder in defense of Poland against his friend Vladimir was very severely undermined. But seriously speaking, of course, there isn't uh, an alternative. Um, I would just say in defense of the French option that what you see as a threat namely involving Russia, uh, I see as uh, an opportunity because Russia is very difficult, particularly for Poland. But I would be willing to pay some kind of price for Russia being on our side in the great rivalry with China because that puts Poland in the secure... um, uh, you know, far behind the front line of of of, of what's what might happen. Whereas, if um, we mishandle Russia and Russia sides with China, then Poland is again a front line state. And you know, when I was defense minister, I declassified those uh, war fighting maps of the Warsaw Pact um, from the 1970s. And they showed that after our invasion of the West, the West would nuke Vistula and Oda lines and Poland would be completely obliterated. And I wouldn't want to volunteer my country for a battle zone again. Uh, two fingers, if, if, if I may, you're right. But the problem is timing. The Russians don't want to choose as we wish. They will make a choice for all our, their own choosing as the Second World War. And that changes this dynamic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, could be or should be a, a conclusion of our debate. Uh, Nova Confederacja, of course, uh, tries to advise and share uh, expertise, but of course within the framework of non-partisan organization. Uh, thank you so much for this thought-provoking discussion. Uh, it has been a great, great pleasure, and I'm confident that this is not the last time when those extremely important questions uh, are the subject of uh, Nova Confederacia's debate. I would like to thank our distinguished guests for joining us today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, Pleasure. Thanks. Uh, thank you once again. And uh, we uh, warmly, warmly welcome you to subscribe to Nova Confederacia's YouTube channel. I like fan, uh, fan page on Facebook and follow on Twitter for more content. You can find links in the description below. And a short reminder, the new book of uh, Dr. Jacek Bartoszak, The End of the End of History, is available on, in Polish only on Nova Confederacja's website. Thank you very much uh, for this fruitful debate. Goodbye and good luck. Bye-bye. Bye.